Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alex Petrashevsky and today I'm going to be presenting on cancer and combining traditional and metabolic treatment paradigms. So just a little bit about me, I'm a fellow of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and I'm a foundation member of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. I'm also one of the co-directors of Sydney Low Carb Specialists, which is a doctor, dietitian and health coach integrated team in Sydney. We use a variety of um, low carb techniques to treat uh, many different conditions and increasingly we're seeing more and more cancer patients coming in looking to optimise their, their treatment with nutrition. And prior to that I spent four years working in Southwest Sydney Cancer Services as well. So in the short term we have today, I'm going to discuss the current cancer paradigm to treatment, explain an alternative perspective on ca cancer pathophysiology, uh, discuss some adjuvant treatments that can be used, <clears throat> and provide some practical tips on potentially combining the standard and alternative uh, metabolic treatments. But just as a quick disclaimer, this is not uh, individual medical advice. So if we look at the, the leading causes of chronic disease-related death in Australia at the moment, we can quickly see that these five uh, diseases make up the bulk of what kills people when it comes to chronic disease. So ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, dementia and cancer. And we now recognise that insulin resistance is, is an underlying factor in all of these conditions to a significant extent. But interestingly, most of these conditions are considered modern diseases or, or diseases of um, modernity, except for cancer, which has uh, been with us from the start. So if we look at the, the, the traditional cancer treatments that uh, most patients would get if they were being treated at the moment, they would typically get a combination of either surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy or hormone therapy. There are some newer targeted agents that target specific receptors or gene targets, and for certain tumours, immunotherapy or bone marrow transplants can be used. But if we go back to the middle of the 20th century, there were some competing theories on how to view cancer and therefore how to treat it. German physiologist Otto Warburg did extensive research of cancer cell metabolism and found that cancer cells continue to ferment lactate to produce energy even in the, f in, even in the presence of oxygen, which is not like normal cells. So this was dubbed the Warburg effect. He also examined mitochondria in cancer cells and noticed some defects in their structure and function. And so he concluded that this dysfunctional fermentation was the signature behaviour of cancer cells. At roughly the same time, Watson and Crick discovered DNA, uh, which was then used to study cellular metabolism. And as soon as some cancer cells were found to have genetic mutations and defects, this really set the ball rolling on most of the cancer research for the next half a century. So um, in large part, the Warburg theory fell out of favour. However, recently, the metabolic theory of cancer is gaining a resurgence, thanks in no small part to, to the work of Thomas Seyfried and other researchers like him. He practiced out of Boston College in the US and observed that the defective respiration of mitochondria was a primary driver of cancer cell behaviour and put forth the hypothesis that this, the genetic mutations that we would see in cancers are actually downstream from this. In other words, it was the abnormal metabolism that was then causing the genetic mutations to occur. And so following on from this, uh, he felt that if we focused exclusively on genetic mutations, uh, we were not really getting to the root cause of the issue and were unlikely to produce significant results with this. And so his lab's working model of cancer at the moment is one of cancer being a metabolic disease involving defective mitochondria. Thankfully, these two competing ways of looking at cancer are slowly being brought together, and on the most recent update on the hallmarks of cancer, we can see an important new addition, which is this dysregulated cellular metabolism. So finally, there is a growing acknowledgement that abnormal cellular metabolism is one of the fundamental criteria that makes a cancer cell what it is. If we look at how cells can gain energy, there are actually a few different ways they can do it. So in normal cells, uh, in the presence of oxygen, they can take a glucose molecule shunt it into the mitochondria and produce 36 molecules of ATP for energy, which is a pretty good um, outcome. So that's what's called oxidative phosphorylation, and it needs oxygen to be present for it to work. If the cell doesn't have oxygen, it can take that glucose molecule and ferment it to produce lactate as a byproduct, and that's a process called anaerobic glycolysis. You only get two molecules of ATP with this, but um, the important note is the cell can do this in the absence of oxygen, so most people will be familiar with this in a setting of intense exercise where the muscle may not have as much uh, oxygen. Tumour cells, or highly proliferative tissues like embryonic tissue, however, get a lot of their energy through a different means. So they will take this glucose uh, molecule and uh, most of it will not go into the mitochondria and instead it is fermented as well to produce lactate. And this is what's called aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect. 
On average, you get about four molecules of ATP doing this. And importantly, the tumor cell would do this whether there's oxygen there or not. Now, there is one final way our cells can get energy, and that's through ketone body metabolism. So if the liver is producing significant amounts of ketone bodies that diffuse into the blood and then into the other cells of the body, the cell can uh, put that ketone body into the mitochondria and produce 22 molecules of ATP. So again, a pretty good return on investment when it comes to energy uh, metabolism. But importantly, to do this, the cell needs a functional mitochondria. So if you're a cancer cell and you don't have well-functioning mitochondria, you effectively can't use these pathways very well. So if we go back to the standard treatments we use to treat cancer and look through this list and think about how many of them are acknowledging this metabolic um, nuance, you can kind of see none of them do really. So the question is then naturally posed, if we're dealing with a metabolic uh, disease, do we need to look at a metabolic therapy? So if we take on board the idea that cancer cells can't effectively use ketones and have immense glucose hunger while normal cells can use both, the natural reaction would be to ask, can we starve cancer cells of glucose? And so a ketogenic diet, which is basically minimizing glucose levels and maximizing ketone levels in the blood is a, a powerful intervention for cancer potentially, because the normal cells can use ketones and they will still compete with the cancer cells for the glucose, whilst the cancer cells really only have the glucose available for their own energy. To further this concept, the glucose ketone index is a simple, elegant way of quantifying the degree of therapeutic activity of a ketogenic diet. And it's a very simple calculation, basically being the ratio of your circulating glucose divided by your circulating beta-hydroxybutyrate, which, uh, which is the main ketone body in the blood. And as a single value, it gives you a quick, simple um, relationship between the major fermentable tumor fuel, which is glucose, and the major non-fermentable fuel, which is ketone bodies. And there is some um, uh, research and theory that the relationship between the glucose ketone index and the, the effectiveness of metabolic therapy uh, should track fairly closely. The optimal GKI is considered to be uh, as low as you can get in essence, so um, ideally between one and two, although under one, um, depending on which papers you read, may actually be more useful. And ideally, you want to be measuring, measuring the GKI two to three hours postprandial. So you may be thinking this metabolic theory of cancer sounds pretty sound, being in ketosis might be a really simple cure for cancer. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. So to grow, a cell doesn't just need energy, it needs the building blocks, so to make the organelles and the phospholipid layer and whatnot, whatnot. These building blocks came in various different forms, and one of them is actually glutamine, which is an amino acid. Cancer cells are unfortunately um, adept at fermenting both glucose and glutamine for fuel. And in fact, cancer cells are very glutamine hungry. They use between 10 and 100 times as much glutamine as a normal cell. And this provides a backdoor for energy substrate to get into the cancer cell. And so even if we close the front door, which is the glucose, the back door still remains open. And unfortunately, glutamine is the most abundant circulating amino acid in the body, which means we're not gonna be able to diet this away. So if we want a truly reliable way of starving a cancer cell, we need to close the front door and we need to close the back door. So this actually has been studied in the past. So glutamine um, inhibitors and analogues were um, attracting interest as early as the 1950s. Uh, and there are several available, the most promising of which was, was one called 6 diazooxonolorsine or LDOM. And in cell cultures, this showed quite um, potent anti-cancer cell activity. The problem is was when we transferred that into human trials, um, it was quite toxic. So our normal cells are dependent on glutamine as well. And so neurotoxicity, gut toxicity, and bone marrow and immune system toxicity were significant issues using these drugs in, in real patients. Uh, and so unfortunately, the interest with these drugs fell by the wayside. But it's important to note that back then, they weren't really combining this with a low, uh, low glucose state or a ketogenic diet, so the cancer cells still had, had access to glucose for energy. And it may be the case that we could get away with a lower dose of this if we're, if we're shutting the front door. So that leads us to the most current concept in the metabolic management of cancer, which is the press pulse. So this general concept can be applied to the management of cancer by creating a chronic metabolic stress on tumor cell metabolism. So that's the press disturbance and will commonly take the form of either a ketogenic diet or caloric restriction. And then intermittently uh, producing acute stress on the cells in terms of um, further glucose or glutamine uh, inhibition or oxidative stress. So that's a pulse disturbance and that could take the form of a glutamine inhibitor or chemotherapy or other potential agents. So the idea behind this is we're really le leveraging the fact that cancer cells are not going to recover so well from oxidative stress. 
and, and hopefully during those pulses of treatment we're really depriving them as much fuel as we can. There are some adjuncts we can use with our pulse treatments to potentially make them stronger. So hyperbaric oxygen and hypothermia are well studied with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, and in, no surprise that they're effective because they also incre increase oxidative stress, uh, more so on cancer cells than on normal cells. Insul insulin infusions are an interesting one. So you may think that seems like an odd choice given that insulin is a growth factor for cells and we know that insulin resistance is, is well associated with a variety of different cancers. But if we give a bolus of insulin before, say, chemotherapy or something like that, we are forcing the blood sugar down even further at a time when the cancer cell is about to get stressed even further. So, so it's really depriving even more glucose from that cancer cell. High dose vitamin C is actually a pro-oxidant. So at low doses, which is what most people are familiar with, with, with um, oral vitamin C tablets, it's an antioxidant. But at high doses, vitamin C is actually pro-oxidant. So it's been combined with chemotherapies in the past and actually increases the effectiveness of these treatments in trials. And there are some other agents that are more in the investigational stage. Now, it's not just about food and drugs. We need to account for all of the other um, factors that have a profound uh, effect on hormonal balance and hormesis. So that includes stress, sleep, circadian rhythm. Um, Heat and cold are useful hormetics as well, so they, they sort of help the body um, either heal or um, produce more pro-oxidant uh, state at the right time. We need to make sure that environmental toxins are absent because these are well known to affect hormonal balance and actually can damage mitochondria in themselves. And then also the social and emotional environment that a patient's in is always an important piece <coughs> of the puzzle when it comes to improving their health. So unfortunately, there isn't much evidence when it comes to combining all of these strategies that I've discussed into one sort of protocol. And to date, there haven't been any large-scale randomised controlled trials incorporating them all together. In fact, due to the reluctance to pursue this space amongst most oncologists, good data has been difficult to accumulate in the past. And it's often been limited to smaller centres, um, typically in other countries where they're um, more loose with their requirements. However, there are case reports accumulating, which is the best you can do when you can't get good funding for a randomised trial. So I'm just going to present one now. So this is a case report of a 29-year-old woman who presented with a stage 4 triple negative breast cancer. At diagnosis, she unfortunately had a very large uh, primary mass in her left breast and multiple lymph nodes and liver metastases as well. So she was considered incurable at her diagnosis. She actually sought out a, a centre in Turkey that has an interest in metabolically supported cancer uh, treatment and she underwent their protocol which involved a modified chemo regimen, which you can see there, uh, with a 12 hour fast prior to each, each dose and she also got 5 to 10 units of insulin prior, uh, prior to her chemo uh, with the aim of getting her blood sugar between 2.8 and 3.3. She was commenced on a ketogenic diet immediately and on treatment day she also received hypothermia up to 45 degrees and hyperbaric oxygen. So this protocol lasted four months and at the six month mark they did some repeat um, imaging and you can see the response. So on the left the PET scan shows the widespread disease in her left breast and auxiliary nodes and in the liver and on the right she's got a complete response. So the only trace you can see there is in her kidneys which is completely normal. So. A reasonable criticism at this stage from an oncologist might be, well that's fine, the scan doesn't show up any cancer but there may still be some microscopic disease and she, this, this lady's going to have a recurrence later because of that. So the team went to the surgical team and said, look, can you operate now? Because she was considered uh, surgically inoperable initially. And they actually agreed to do a mastectomy and auxiliary lymph node clearance on her. And um, quite astoundingly, she's got a complete pathological response on histology. So the picture on the left there shows you where the, the tumour was in her breast, so just scar tissue, no active disease. And on the right there is one of her uh, lymph nodes, which again similarly shows no active disease. There have been some small human trials demonstrating the feasibility and safety of a ketogenic diet in cancer patients with, without any significant side effects and potentially improved outcomes. Um, and there more, are some more trials coming, but in, the interest in this space remains relatively small compared to the amount of research being done with conventional therapeutics like cancer and, and radiotherapy. So where does that leave the average clinician and the average cancer patient in 2022? Well, at the moment we can say that there is solid mechanistic data to back up metabolic therapy for cancer. However, there is limited randomised controlled trial data, and the most compelling data to date has been largely case reports, which are um, hard to completely extrapolate out to most patients. 
But we can tell people that we can do press treatment long term without any major side effects. We've got over a century of data now showing in epilepsy patients showing that a ketogenic diet is safe in the long term. And as many people know now, there are a myriad of other potential benefits that low carb diets um, can produce as well. The pulse treatments are going to be a little bit more toxic and therefore they need to be used more judiciously. And unfortunately, a reliable, safe glutamine blocker isn't available at the moment, so we don't have a perfectly safe, clean, elegant solution. So in the clinic, we have to be clear with patients about the limitations of the research to date. Uh, so the consent process needs to be clear with patients that we can't promise a cure with diet alone, and as it stands, a ketogenic diet or other metabolic therapies are not considered a standalone uh, treatment for patients. Uh, so patients often have self-selected and have already commenced the diet when they come to us, but if not, we have to be very clear on this, and we have to tell them the ketogenic diet um, uh, is unlikely to be harmful, and it comes with other potential benefits. And at the moment, we'd recommend that patients still have conventional therapy as per their oncological team, so whether that's surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, especially chemotherapy because it works as, as that sort of pulse treatment, so it's quite nice. The other thing to note is even if we can't achieve a cure for patients, uh, many patients with stage 4 disease, which is typically considered incurable, um, may potentially live longer or have a higher quality of life on this treatment. So that's an important consideration as well, um, especially when we consider that a lot of the palliative treatments that patients are put on are, are highly toxic and may prolong life by a little bit, but at, at the expense of quality of life. And in the future, with better research, we may get to a point where this is actually considered a less costly um, way of prolonging life in stage four patients, because unfortunately, a lot of the palliative treatments we have at the moment are, are quite expensive, despite the, the modest benefits to patients. So at initial assessment, we need to identify any contraindications or cautions with pursuing a ketogenic diet in the setting of cancer. So a caution needs to be applied to any patient with an active eating disorder, especially anorexia nervosa. Significant cachexia or malnutrition is always a concern, and many patients are malnourished before they're even diagnosed, and, and often they will have had sections of their gastrointestinal tract cut out or, or disrupted with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, so nutrient absorption can be an issue. Um, and finally, there are a subset of tumours that may potentially not respond that well to a ketogenic diet, particularly the BRAF V600E mutation. There's some very early data in cell lines showing that this type of mutation may actually predict for, for increased growth on ketogenic diets. Now this is not particularly convincing yet because a cell, is not, a cell line is not the body and there are so many other hormonal factors involved, um, but it, we just need to be a little bit careful with these patients. As far as the diet, we'd usually suggest a, a roughly 3 to 1 ratio of fat to protein, so that's more in line with a traditional ketogenic diet, so more fat and relatively less protein than some more modern, well-balanced ketogenic diets. And we typically keep the, diet, the carbs as low as possible, ideally, so under 20 grams a day. We're usually aiming for a GKI of between 1 and 2, although if we can get it under 1, that's great. Uh, and, and we need to apply some caution with overeating protein. So we know that if patients overdo the protein, they're going to stimulate some insulin and, the, and also excess protein may be a, a growth driver for the body, which is going to affect the cancer cells as well. Finally, we need to be a little bit careful with excess dairy in the estrogen sensitive cancers, so breast and endometrial particularly. Now for the GKI to be optimal, it really relies on the ketone levels being as high as you can get them, otherwise you're not going to get a good reading. So if blood ketones aren't high, then we need to do some troubleshooting typically. The first point of call is always to check the macros to make sure that there aren't too many carbs or too much protein creeping in, and this is where our dietitians are really helpful uh, to help patients with uh, tracking their macros and using apps and whatnot to, to help identify where things might be going wrong. MCT oil and exogenous ketones can be used to bump up the ketone levels and they can be used for, for lean people who can't afford to, to lose too much weight to begin with. And finally, fasts are a really great way of forcing a deeper state of ketosis, although obviously that can't be done indefinitely. So, so they are a really powerful addition to a ketogenic diet and, and they really help reduce growth signals and increase apoptosis. They, they are very effective at optimising the GKI because they are simultaneously, when you're fasting, you're increasing your ketones and driving your sugar down even further. And there's, there's good evidence that fasting can actually improve the tumorocidal effects of different treatments, particularly chemotherapy, uh, and can also reduce treatment side effects, and that includes chemo and radiation. And in terms of putting all the, the adjuncts into practice in the clinic with what we have available, we often tell patients to, to do a therapeutic fast before their chemotherapy. 
Um, if patients have access to hyperbaric oxygen, that's something they can pursue, although availability is going to be an issue in many places. If they've got access to sauna for the heat, they can um, also pursue that. And then we also want diligent focus on all the non-dietary factors that we mentioned earlier. So I'm just going to finish with an example case from the clinic. So this is a 32-year-old male who presented with seizures earlier this year. He had, he had an MRI which unfortunately showed a left temporal mass consistent with a glioblastoma uh, and it wasn't completely resectable so he had a partial resection. He then proceeded to have adjuvant chemo radiotherapy with, so radiotherapy with oral temozolomide and unfortunately he tolerated the, the oral chemotherapy quite poorly. He then had a local recurrence in the temporal lobe a few months later and was recommended to start on IV chemotherapy every 29 days. And before he saw our clinic, he'd actually self-commenced a ketogenic diet and started himself on melatonin, which is one of the, one of the other sort of antioxidant um, adjuvant type treatments that can be used. So when we reviewed him in the clinic, he wasn't measuring his blood ketones, only his urine ketones. He was over-consuming carbohydrates, and unfortunately, he was not someone who was enjoying high-fat foods. He was used to a more low-meat, low-fat diet, so it was quite hard going for him. And he was eating too frequently and not fasting. So we made some changes and attempted to, uh, to optimise those macros to get him closer to that 3 to 1 ratio. We got him to start measuring his GKI twice a day and we got him on two meals a day, uh, which was useful for him because he wasn't really that hungry. And we also suggested fasting for 48 hours before his IV chemotherapy. So after a few more cycles, he said he was tolerating his IV chemotherapy much better, so the nausea was much less pronounced, uh, and he was due to have an MRI in two months to, to track his progress. And at the plan at that stage is to continue the therapeutic ketogenic diet indefinitely, um, and after his treatment is done is hopefully to add in some therapeutic fast periodically as well. So I'm just going to show you a food diary um, from a couple of weeks that, that he'd um, kept for us. So you can see here, in terms of his typical day with two meals, he's still eating some carbohydrates. So as I said, he's not he wasn't really enjoying the, the high fat meals, um, but he was trying to get the carbs as low as he could. And you can see the, the glucose ketone index is rarely getting to that one to two range. In fact, frequently it's not, not close. So he wasn't finding the diet particularly enjoyable. But what he found no problem at all was the fasting. So you can see here on a, on a chemotherapy week, he starts his fast and within that day the ketones are really ramping up. So his GKI is at one, day one. And then by the time he gets to his chemotherapy, it's really driven down. So by the time chemotherapy dose has been given, his GKI is well under one there. CGM can be a really useful tool as well for patients to track where their glucose is at and that sort of gives another surrogate marker for what the GKI is likely to be. So you can see up the top there um, a typical day with the ketogenic diet and in the middle you can see the effect of a higher protein meal. So this patient figured out quite quickly that they were exceeding their protein um, tolerance when they were having a really high protein meal together. And down the bottom you can really see that effect of the fast where it just really drives that blood sugar uh, really low. So just to wrap things up, Ketometabolic therapy in cancer is a truly exciting area of medicine with a lot of untapped potential. However, more research is desperately needed to, to determine how to combine this with either conventional therapies or even potentially as a stand, uh, versus a standard of care. Um, we need a better or safer glutamine blocker desperately or something we can use to, to really block that glutamine metabolism. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to leave you with a comment that we should all be demanding that our cancer fundraising dollar be spent wisely. Cancer research gets a lot of funding, but, and many of the breakthroughs have come, um, but often with only a modest benefit for patients in real world terms. So I'd just like to give a quick plug for Thomas Seyfried's lab in, at Boston College, who do accept uh, donations from the general public to help them continue their important research. All right, thank you for your attention, everyone.